2 Corinthians 5, 6 is where we're going to start today. We've taken a break over the last month and a half for Christmas, Advent season. And then Dustin gave the word last week about Jesus as he teaches us through the Apostles' Creed. And now I'm back, and we're back in 2 Corinthians. And so that's what we're going to pick up today. 2 Corinthians 5, 6. Let me pray for us as we get started with our sermon this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us a guide. Something that we can read to know you and understand you. Lord, we thank you that we are not left to our feelings or to our own understanding, but that you have given us a clear word in the Bible. We ask this morning as we read it that you would give us understanding, that you would make clear what may not have been clear to us already, that we would see you for who you are and that you would, we would see ourselves in light of you. But we ask that as we read this morning, as we ponder your word as we spend time thinking about it and spend time with it, that you would make us confident and courageous, that we would be ready for whatever comes our way in Jesus. Lord, and that you would make us people who please you, that you would reset, maybe for some of us, the orientation of our lives to glorify you. We love you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this morning as we get started, I want you to think about this. This is not a test question. This is not, don't give me an answer. Just think about it. How confident are you? How courageous do you feel? Can you approach difficult situations with the confidence that Christ is with you? Or do you find yourself afraid? This is kind of a gut punch question for me because I wrestle with this a lot. I think most of us do. Confidence can be hard to come by in a fallen world where things go wrong, where people we love betray us, where we get hurt, where we lose our job, where our car breaks down. Confidence is not something that comes naturally in our world. And yet the Bible tells us over and over again to be confident, to have good courage. And these things are related. And we think of courage so often as somebody going to war or somebody giving their life for another person. But the truth is, it takes courage just to live. We face things all the time that are frightening, that are fearful, that are difficult, that may seem overwhelming. And yet, the Bible says over and over again that we should not be afraid, that we should have good courage, that we should be confident. Maybe you've heard it said that confidence or courage is not the absence of fear, but it's doing the right thing even though you're afraid. What I'll tell you is the biblical definition of courage is something more, something different. It's not the absence of fear, but it is what happens when fear meets faith. That's what biblical courage is. And so this morning, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the confidence that God promises to us and why it is that we can live confidently. And more than that, why it is that we ought to live to please God no matter what it costs us in this life. Let me read our passage for us today. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10 says this. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There's a lot of things going on here, even more than confidence. But that's, that's sort of the, the, the hinge point of all of this, the thing that we're going to build all of this on top of, because that's what he says. We are always of good courage. That's how he starts this paragraph. Now, if you remember, six weeks ago, He begins chapter 5 by talking about death and resurrection, by saying that in this body that we're in, we groan. He says that several times, that we groan in, in this world, in this physical body that we're in, longing to put on the eternal, immortal body. And we said that that groaning sometimes is a literal groaning. Sometimes it's 
figurative, but sometimes it's literal. Sometimes you get out of bed and your foot hurts and you groan. Or it's a little bit harder to get around than it used to be, and so you groan. But that all of us, as we live in the fallen world, we are groaning, waiting for eternity, waiting for the redemption of our bodies, waiting for resurrection and hope and our hope to be fulfilled and our time on this earth to be ended and for our time with Christ for eternity to begin. And so that's what he says. So because of that, we are always of good courage. So that's in the background, but he's also going to bring it to the foreground, this, this hope of resurrection. So that's number one. If you're taking notes, that's the first set of blanks. The hope of resurrection makes us confident. That's number one. The hope of resurrection makes us confident. That's what he says. We're always of good courage or we're always confident. The Greek word there is, can go both ways. It means the same thing. Good courage or confident. And so when we say that the hope of resurrection makes us confident, we have to ask why. Why does that make us confident to look forward to resurrection? Well, here's A. Every true Christian will live forever with Jesus. Every true Christian will live forever with Jesus. That's when I say the hope of resurrection. We are not hoping as Christians. And I hope I say this so much that you're like, yeah, we get it already. We're not hoping for heaven. We're hoping for resurrection. All right? Now, sometimes people say heaven, and that's what they mean, is our eternal, immortal state where we've been raised with Christ in perfect bodies and we live forever with him. But a lot of people, when they think of heaven, think of the clouds. Right? We're going to sit on the little clouds with harps and have little tiny wings that are useless, and we just play our harp all day, and we just say, you know, good morning, Brother Dustin. What a great day on the clouds. That's not what we're doing. No, we're going to rise again and live in real physical bodies on a real new heavens and earth where heaven and earth collide and where all the dimensions of existence become one and where all the spiritual realities we believe that we sometimes feel and interact with, the glory of God, the risen Christ, the Holy Spirit, and we're going to be with God in a physical way for all eternity. We're going to walk with the risen Christ. And so that's what he says, that we will live forever with Jesus. That's why he says now we walk by faith and not by sight. I think sometimes people pull that out of context and say, you know, that is an encouragement. And it is, we walk by faith, not by sight. But what he's saying is the reason that we are, that we know that while we're at home in the body now on this earth and that we're away from the Lord is because we walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, our relationship with Christ now is not a physical one. We don't see him. You know, we don't wake up in the morning and Jesus is there. Now he is there, his presence is there, but his physical body is not now with us. So we walk by faith, not by sight. And so what that means is now in this earth, in this body, we're away from Christ. There's a separation there. But one day that's gonna change. That's what he says in verse 8. We're of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now we won't go too deep into this, but this means one simple thing. That when we leave our bodies, we go to be with Jesus. And that when we rise again, we will be still with Jesus. There is no waiting. When you die in Christ, you go to be with the Lord. Okay. This means something else for us as well. That when Jesus promises us eternal life, he means it. It's not a metaphor. We're not saying that Jesus is not saying, you know, you'll find some state of zen or you'll, you know, fade out of existence. And that that'll be your eternal life. No, no, no. When Jesus says eternal life, he means it literally. You will live forever. When we read John 3.16, you know this probably by heart. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And that means, very literally, that we will live again with Jesus. Paul has staked his whole entire life in the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians on the resurrection and the hope of resurrection. And it makes us confident because when we know we're going to rise again, here's B, even death cannot stop us. Even death 
cannot stop us. Even to die is gain because we will rise again. So Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 1 that to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because if we're in Jesus, when we die, we go to be with him. And there is nothing better than that. Or here's 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 58. I gave you this one in your notes. It says this, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. People in the world, people who are lost, people who do not know Christ, people who don't believe in God, they live for this life only. Everything that they do, you know, maybe you've heard that, you only live once. It's unbiblical. You live forever whether you want to or not. You will not only live once. This life is not the end. And so what does he say here in verse 58 of 1 Corinthians 15? He says, therefore, because we're going to rise again, because death is not the end, because in Jesus we have hope beyond this life, we can be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. That because we will live again, God gives us hope beyond this life, which means that everything we do for Jesus has much more than just a benefit for now. It has a benefit forever. And even death can't stop what we accomplish for Christ. Even death cannot stop us. Even death does not end our lives. It ends our lives here on this earth. Our bodies die, but we will live again. And so this should make us confident. What would you do if I told you you could not fail? Right? What, what things are you holding on to saying, well, things could go badly for me. I might die. The Bible promises us that we will die. And yet we know that in Christ's death is not the end. And so not only does it make us confident, it, it takes away our fear. It should take away our fear. When we really understand this truth that we're going to live forever with Jesus, that death is not the end, we can face not only this life, but anything that comes at us with confidence knowing that God will save us, and if he doesn't, we will die and rise again with him. That either way, either way, God will come through for us, and he will be glorified. So, the hope of resurrection makes us confident. And then because we will live again, it changes the aim of our life. So we can be confident facing this life, but also because we're going to live forever, it changes the aim of our life. We're not just living for now. We're not just living for ourselves. We're not just living to make other people happy. We live for something greater. We have an actual purpose beyond this earth. So here's number two. The aim of our lives the aim of our lives should be the glory of our God. I'll say that again. The aim of our lives should be the glory of our God. That's what he says, verse 9. Whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. We make it our aim to please him. There's 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, again, that is a little bit out of context there. It, it means he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 10, eating idol meat, meat that's been sacrificed to idols. And he says, you know, if your conscience afflicts you and you can't do it in good conscience, don't do it. Or if your conscience allows you to do it, do it because it's just meat at the end of the day. But then he, he adds this principle, and this is not just a principle for meat. It's for everything. He says, so whatever you do, whether you, your conscience afflicts you and you don't eat, or whether your conscience sets you free and you can't eat, do it all to the glory of God. That should be the aim of our lives. 
There is a philosophical concept called existentialism, and it's poison. It's a lie, and it's, it's an illusion, and it's poison. Existentialism says you are meaningless, and so if you want to have purpose in this life, concoct your own meaning. Create your own story and find yourself as the hero and become whatever you want to become. Now, they don't typically add to the end what I would add to the end. Become whatever you want to become because everything is pointless and you're just stardust and accidents. So do whatever you want because when you die, it doesn't matter anyway. That's what existentialism is really saying. But the Bible tells us a completely different story. It says because you are created by God in his image for his glory, now you, you have a real purpose, not a purpose you've made up. Not a story you've concocted, not a story anybody else has told you, but the real true story is that God made you for his glory. God made you to please him, to worship him, to show the world how great he is, to be in relationship with him, to demonstrate his love, and to be loved by him. That's part of what it means to be living for the glory of God, that everything we do should be for the glory of God, so that you can eat food for the glory of God. How do you do that? Well, when you eat the food, you thank God for it. You enjoy it as a gift from the one who has given it and you give him praise for it. So you can eat french fries to the glory of God. Right? You can you can drink grape juice to the glory of God. You can do everything you do for the glory of God. You can tie your shoes for the glory of God. It means that we interact with the world in such a way that we praise our God, we live in light of his goodness, and we seek to please him. So here's A. Why do we live for the glory of God? Well, I told you that already, that it gives us a purpose. But this passage gives us two specific things. One is that we want to be with him. We live for the glory of God, A, because we want to be with him. We want to be with him. So verse 8, like we read, we're of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. It's better to leave this earth and be with Christ. And that's not to say you should end your life. You should not do that. That's to say that it redirects your life for God's glory because you want to be with him. Relationships is the first motivation of our life with Christ. So that's the, the, it's not numbered, but it's the statement underneath there. We should be motivated primarily by our relationship with Jesus. We should be motivated primarily by our relationship with Jesus. Our salvation is not a transaction. It's not, it is a transaction. It's not just a transaction. It's not like we go to the counter and we say, hello, Jesus, I'll have one salvation, please. And then we leave. It's not like that. It's that salvation is when we enter into life with Christ and we welcome him into our lives as our Lord and as our Savior and as the only one who can rescue us and as the one who has the words of eternal life and who has true purpose to give us. And when we do that, when we really realize what it is to be saved, that we walk with Christ, not that we walk behind him or that we walk in front of him, that we walk with him and he is in us. And he walks through us and he lives through us and in us and he gives us joy and peace and all of the good things that come. But we also get to know him and be with him. And that is what should motivate us to glorify God. Not because we owe God anything, although we owe him everything, but not like we could pay him back. God doesn't ask us to pay him back because we can't. No, but because we love him and he loves us, now we do what he asks us to do. John 14, 15, Jesus gives us this gut punch of a statement. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We've talked about this before, that love means doing things. Love is not just a word. It's not just a feeling. It's not just a thing you say. It's something that you live out. If I love my wife, I do certain things for her. And if I don't love her, then there are other things that I do. If I love my wife when she says, hey, would you mind doing the dishes? I say, yes, because I love you. Now, think about this. If, if she says, would you mind doing the dishes? And I pull out my phone and I say, all right, hold on just a second. Let me check and see if I owe you any dishes tonight. 
but it's a completely different thing. Even if I say, yeah, it looks like you did the dishes 527 times in our marriage, and I've only done them 522, I'll do the next four, and then we'll be even. It doesn't work that way. I say, no, because I love you, I'll do the dishes. Or if I brought her flowers, <clears throat> and she says, why would you bring me these flowers? And I say, well, you know, it's just what you're supposed to do, I guess. It ruins it, right? But if I say, I brought you these flowers because I love you, it changes things. And so the primary motivation of our lives, of our obedience to Christ, should be our relationship with Jesus. Here's B. Why do we glorify God? Why do we live for the glory of God? And this is completely biblical and acceptable. This may surprise you. Because we want to be rewarded. Because we want to be rewarded. God promises us reward all throughout the scriptures. Notice verse 10 of our passage in 2 Corinthians 5. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now this is important here. It's important that we notice this. He says we must all appear, for one, and he says we must all appear. He's not just talking about unbelievers here. Every single one of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now that shouldn't make us fear if we are in Jesus, if we are trusting in him as our savior, as the one who can take away our sins, as the only one who can take away our sins. If we're in Jesus, that should not make us fear. That's not the, that's not the idea. Instead, those of us who are in Christ, when we stand before the judgment seat, our sins will be read, all right? And yet, <clears throat> they will be washed away. We will be counted not guilty, even though we are guilty. So we're not going to receive punishment from God at any point because for those of us who are in Jesus every single punishment for every single sin for all of our entire lives has been laid on him and it has been dealt with so when you read that I don't want you to think oh man God's going to weigh my sins against my good deeds and I'm going to be in trouble because we're all in trouble if God is going to count all of our bad deeds against us and only our good deeds are the, the things that can outweigh every single one of us is going to hell forever. But praise God, that is not the way it works. It's been paid for in Christ. So if you're in Christ, you will stand before God's judgment seat, but you will be counted not guilty. But then there's this other thing, right? He says we make it our aim to please him because we're all going to stand before him and we're going to be rewarded, those of us who are in Christ, again, will be rewarded for the good things that we do. This is not the only place that says this. Here's 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Now this is speaking specifically to church leaders, but again, there's a principle here for all of us. So he says this, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Let me explain this a little bit. So like I said, in the context, he's talking about building up the church. He's talking to church leaders because, I don't know if you remember, in 1 Corinthians, they had split up into these factions and they said, you know, I'm on Dustin's team, I'm on Josh's team. And some people thought they were extra holy and they said, well, I'm on Jesus' team. And Paul says, no, Christ is not divided. We don't do that. Because we're all, all the church leaders, they're just building on the foundation that was laid. And so... They need to take care of how they build on it. They're, God's going to test what they build. But this, this principle exists for all of us, right? That we have a foundation. There's only one foundation you can build on. It's Jesus. If you build your building on anything besides Jesus, it's all going to be destroyed. Nothing's going to last. It doesn't matter what good things you do. If you don't have a foundation of Christ, it's worthless. But if Jesus is your foundation, then we enter into a new situation where now we get to build 
on that foundation. And he says, all right, take care how you build. If you use gold and silver and precious stones and you build something amazing for Jesus, then you're going to be rewarded. But if you build with wood, cheap wood and hay and straw, and it's all going to burn up, you're not going to be rewarded. So what that means is this. If you are saved, if you're in Christ, say, man, Jesus is my Savior. I'm washed clean. Now we are tasked with a mission of doing things for Jesus, right? Jesus gives us all kinds of commands. To do good, to love our neighbor, to love our enemies, to forgive those who hate us, to give a cup of cold water to those in need, to preach the gospel, to honor God in all that we do, to glorify Him. And so everything that we do for God's glory is like those precious stones. Every good thing we do, everything we do that Christ has commanded us to do is building on the foundation and then we're going to be rewarded for those things. Every time you attempt to share the gospel with somebody, God has sees that and he's going to reward you. Or if what you build is worthless and it's not for God's glory, it's for your glory. If your foundation is in Christ and you know, you're covered by his blood and yet you don't follow his commands or sometimes you do, but sometimes you don't, right? You can, as long as you are following Jesus, you're trusting in him alone to save you. You are saved. It's by grace through faith, not by works. And yet our works count. Our works count. If you build with hay and straw on the foundation of Christ, you will not receive a reward. It's just going to be burned up. And here's what he says, too, that scares me a little bit. He will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So here's, here's the next little blank there. We should be motivated secondarily by our own good. By our own good. Let me explain what I mean by that. It's okay to, to care about yourself. You should. It's okay to do things because they're good for you and for other people. That's okay. Now, we do everything we do for the glory of God. But again, it's okay to act in your best interest. Let me give you some examples. If I offer you a plate full of rocks or a plate of brownies, and you say, you know, I think I'll, I'll, I'll eat the rocks. It seems like the righteous thing to do. No, that's not smart. right? We act in our own best interest. You would say, no, no, no. I will not eat the rocks. I'll have the brownies instead, please. Or if I say, hey, okay, I pulled it up on the GPS. This place we're going is an hour and a half away. We can take this one route that will get us there in 75 minutes, or we could take this other route that will get us there in two days and 40, and in two days and four hours. You would say, no, no, let's take the 75 minute route and not the two day route. That's okay to act in your own best interest. And what the Bible tells us is that our primary best interest, the way that we can most care for ourselves is to glorify God, to be rewarded by him. So I'm not saying live a selfish life where all you do is, is get what you want out of this life. Because the truth is that that seems like it's the best thing for you, but really it's the thing that is not the best for you. It's the thing that is going to cause you eternal harm. The best way to care for yourself is to follow Christ and do what he says. That is the way to your own self-interest, and that is the way to primarily care for yourself, is to do the things that you know God is going to reward you with. Does that make sense? I'm not saying be selfish. I'm saying there is a kind of selfishness that is good and godly. God is selfish in the sense that God lives for his own glory. Because not only is that the best thing for the world, but that's the best thing for God. There is no one as glorious as God. If God lived for the glory of another, it would be wrong. It would be crazy. So that there is a kind of selfishness that is good, and that is to... Give up yourself, to die to yourself so that you can live. Notice even Jesus, I didn't give you this one in the notes, but even Jesus, when he says to his disciples, take up your cross daily and follow me, what he says is whoever would seek to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Notice how that's phrased. What he's saying is if you want to live, which you do because we all want to live, then come and die with me and you'll live forever. So you notice that even that is phrased in a self-interested way. That because you want to live, come and die with me. Because if you want to live, 
The worst way to live is to live for yourself on this earth at the expense of other people because then you're going to die forever. Here's Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Again, this is an appeal to our self-interest and it's not, not a wrong one. Jesus makes this appeal. He says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Notice what he's saying there. It's good and right to lay up treasure for yourself. But he says the difference is where you're laying it up. If you're hoarding it on earth when you could be doing good and glorifying God with it, it's going to burn up and rust and thieves are going to steal it. But if you want to make a really good investment for eternity, the best thing that you can do is to lay it all up in heaven. And the way we lay it up in heaven is by giving it away for the glory of God. By spending ourselves for the glory of God, we make a, a spiritual currency exchange where we turn our treasure on earth into treasure in heaven. And that's, again, that's for our own self-interest. And that is okay. That is okay. Because that is what is ultimately good for us. And because God is so wise, what is ultimately good for us is also what's best for everyone else and for God. Here's Matthew 25, 21. Jesus has given this parable. Let me, let me give you a paraphrase of the parable. It says, there are three servants. And the master of those servants is going away. And he gives each of the servants a different amount of money. He gives one of the servants ten talents, which is just a bunch of money. He gives another servant five talents, and he gives another servant two talents. I think. Yes, that's right. One or two. The master goes away. The guy who has the ten talents, he takes it, he invests it, and he makes twenty talents. So now he's got double his money. The guy who had the five talents, he does the same thing. He invests it, and it comes back at, I think it's 10 talents. And then the third guy who was given two talents, he goes and he buries his money. And he says, well, at least I didn't lose it. So the master comes back and he says, how did it go? I gave you this money. What did you do with it? The first guy, he says, who had the 10 talents, says, I made 20. The master looks at him and he says these words. And again, Jesus here is talking about us with God. He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. And here's the best part. Enter into the joy of your master. Second guy, five talents, turns it into ten. Same situation. The master says to him the exact same phrase in verse 23. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the third guy who buried his money... The Lord says to him, basically, you failed me. I gave you the opportunity. I gave you these talents to go and use for my glory and for your own glory. And yet you wasted them. You buried them. And I think he turns them over to the jailer to be jailed. And then Jesus turns around and he says, guys, look, duh, this is obviously about you and God. I don't just tell you these stories for my own benefit. And, that, and that's what it's about for us. We are the servants who have been given much. You may not feel like it, but if you live in America, you are one of the richest people in the world. We have been given so much, not just in money, but also in time and talent and ability. Whatever God has given us, he's given us for a purpose, to glorify him, to bless other people, and to store up treasure for ourselves in heaven. God often does not pay in worldly things. Sometimes he does. Sometimes God's blessings look like worldly things, and that's okay, but not always. The problem with the prosperity gospel is not that they're completely wrong. It's that they have the timeline mixed up. The prosperity gospel says, you give and God will give back to you now. Right? If you sow your ministry seed, then God will give you the car that you want. He'll pay off your debts. He'll give you the house you want. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, give to God everything you have, all that you can afford to give him, and he will pay you back 
for eternity. Not now, not here on this earth. You can't manipulate God into getting the things you want by giving a ministry seed. But God does say, plant your seed for eternity. Lay up your treasure in heaven. Give it away and it will be given back to you forever. I think about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and he said, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? First thing Jesus says is, why do you call me good? No one's good but God. But then he says this. He says, come follow me. Sell all your things. Come follow me. And the guy looks around and he says, well, I can't do that. He says he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus said, sell all you have, come follow me. And he had all of his stuff and he said, I'd rather have my stuff now than have you forever. So then the disciples look at Jesus and they're like, what about us? So we, we've given up everything to follow you, which is, it's kind of a baby response, but you know, they're the disciples, they don't know a lot yet. They say, we've given up everything. And Jesus says, yes, and I tell you, no one will lose anything for my sake except that it will be repaid to him on this earth 60-fold with persecutions and then 100-fold for eternity. Like God blesses primarily forever. If the rich young ruler had been willing to give up what he had, he would have gained more than he could have possibly imagined. He would have suffered in this life and he would have been crowned with glory for eternity. And yet he went away sad because he missed it. Because the aim of his life was pleasure and ease and comfort and not the glory of God. And it's the same thing for us. Here's the last thing I'll say. And I'm going to encourage us with the gospel. If you want to lose, if you want to find your life, if you want to be rich, if you want to be rich, really rich, rich forever, give it all away for the glory of God. Come after him. Give Jesus everything you are and everything you have, and he will make you rich beyond your wildest dreams for all eternity. Or, if you want to be rich now on this earth, you can do that too. But it will cost you everything. Because if you live for yourself now, you miss out on God for eternity. But if you live for God now, he will bless you forever in Christ. Now, if it's still not clear to you, or if, I, if I've confused you and said it's okay to be selfish, what I'm saying is live for the glory of God, and that is the best thing for you, is to live for God's glory. Because it's the only thing worth doing. It's the only thing that's going to last. God is the only one who can reward you forever. This earth is going to burn up and disappear. But what we do for Christ, we can be confident will last for all eternity. Because here we were, sinners, dead in our trespasses and sins, and Christ came, God sent his son to live a perfect life and die a perfect death to raise us from the dead, to rescue us from the death that we'd earned by our sins and to save us from ourselves. And he asks us not to, not to do things to earn that salvation, but to trust in him. So this morning, the question you have to ask yourself, am I trusting in Jesus to save me or am I not? And then if you are, if you are in Christ, am I living for God's glory alone or am I living for my own glory? And if you're living for God's glory, you can be confident that nothing you do will be wasted. Because God doesn't waste anything, and he rewards those who love him. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. And we thank you that you have given us Christ. And we thank you that you have promised us an inheritance in the heavens that is unfading, that will not fail that will not disappear, that moth and rust cannot destroy, and that thieves cannot break in and steal. Lord, help us to live with an eternal perspective. Help us to realize that the best thing we can do for ourselves and for others and for you is to deny ourselves and come after Christ. That if we want to find true life, an abundant life, 
We have to give up our lives for you. Lord, if there's anyone here who is still dead in their sins, who Jesus is not their Savior, who is not trusting in Christ by faith to save them, I ask that you would convict them of their sins this morning, that they would realize that they are dead, that they are in need of a Savior, and that you would give them the gift of faith and save them. That they would come running to you, repenting of their sins, trusting in Jesus as the only Savior, and that you would save them. Lord, for those of us here who are in Christ, help us to be generous. Help us to love you more than this world. Help us to love ourselves more than this world. Lord, help us to turn our, all of our being toward you, to be willing to give up our lives so that we might live with you forever. Lord, strengthen the relationships that we have with one another and with Christ that love would be the primary motivator of our entire lives, that we would do what we do for the glory of Christ and the glory of others, and in doing so that we would find our purpose and our own glory as well. Lord, help us to never get those motivations twisted up. Let us do what we do out of love first, and then out of our own self-interest second, realizing that love is the best thing for us and everyone else. God, we are desperately in need of you and your grace. Every single day that we live, we do what we do. We do what we do for you because you give us the strength. And so I ask that you would strengthen us as we go this week as well. Lord, we ask all these things for your glory and your name. We thank you for your love in Jesus Christ. Amen.